Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me to another episode of The Money Minutes. Uh, we're going to be meeting with Susanna Winsboro today, who is a state lawyer in the Mississauga area. She's been practicing for over 16, 16 years with KMD Law, and she's going to be helping us understand Will's power of attorneys and some of the state planning strategies a little bit better. Susanna, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're going to talk uh, about a few strategies of state planning. And the first one, the first basic question I want to ask you is, what's really, um, what is really a will? And, and why should people have it? Should everyone have it? But let's, let's take one step at a time. <laughs> Sure. So a will is a legal document that allows you to direct how your assets are going to be distributed on your death. And in Ontario, it is a written document um, that has certain requirements for it to be valid. And within that document, you do have testamentary freedom, which means that you can, subject to some um, rules about taking care of your dependents, you can leave your assets in whatever manner you like. And, and what happens if somebody has no will and they pass? So if you don't have a will in Ontario, then that means that you have passed away or you've died intestate. And there are rules in the Succession Law Reform Act that set out what would happen in that situation. So if in that situation you have a spouse and you have children, then the first $350,000 of your estate, that is your assets that you own individually, those will go to your spouse. And the balance of your estate will be distributed amongst your spouse and your children. Now, if you have one child, it's distributed 50-50 between your spouse and child. If you have more than one child, then it would be one third to your spouse and two thirds amongst your children. So that's, you know what, not too many people know about this because the basic general understanding is if anything happened to me, everything will go to my spouse. So that's good to know. Yeah. Um, so you're saying anything jointly held um, goes to the person survivor, but anything that's, that's held in my personal account would not automatically go to my spouse, right? Not automatically. It depends on, on the value of those assets. Okay. And then in the event that you don't have a spouse, everything would go to your children. And if you have no children, then what happens in that situation is it would go up to your parents and you have no living parents. It goes down to your siblings. And if you have no living siblings, it will go down to their children. So there is a, there is a, um, a path out to relatives, out to your next of kin for those assets. And if at the end of the day, no one can be found, then your estate would go to the government. That's great to know. Susanna, a lot of my clients say, can I write my own will? And, and I want to even take a step back and say, does everyone need a will? I would say it is best to have a will. And the reason I say that is a lot of times people think that they have a very basic situation. Everything they want is going to go to, or everything they have rather is going to go to their spouse and then it will go to their children. And that's not necessarily true if they don't have a will. And oftentimes when people are saying, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just write my own will. In that situation, they're not taken through an estate plan where things like trusts are discussed. And there may be situations where they have maybe a child who um, isn't very good with their finances, or they have a child who maybe has um, special needs that they would really need to consider setting up a trust for them. It doesn't make sense to give them an outright distribution. Um, so I do think, yes, I mean, everybody, everybody can write their own will so long as they're over the age of 18 and they have mental capacity, you could do that, but it's not recommended because there is so much more to your estate planning than just writing a will. Mm -hmm. And I also, I've seen this happen in my professional life where um, a family first marriage had a will and then husband moved to BC, got married again, 
and had another will. And, uh, you know, at that time I was working at RBC and I found out that we, we have two wills in place and we couldn't release any of the money until everything was sorted out. And this was, both the wills were handwritten and they were both challenged by families. Hmm. So technically a will that's signed after another will does revoke the previous will, but I can understand in that situation where there's there's some um, speculation as to the validity of either of the wills that that perhaps the second one wouldn't have revoked the former one. So that, I do understand that. That's exactly what happened. Like that's, you know, if somebody challenges a, a handwritten will, and somebody challenges the date of the will or the validity, oh, you, you're you stuck for, for many. You could be, yes. Yeah. So that's going to go through the court system and it's going to eat away at the estate assets. And I mean, at, at the end of the day, it makes sense just to sit down with a lawyer and have a proper will drafted so that your family isn't going through that. Exactly, exactly. Um, so you're saying handwritten wills are good, but at the same time, if you want things to be solid, concrete, so that nobody's fighting over them, you should have a um, a valid uh, lawyer written out will that you know that is um, that's not going to give your family a, a headache at the end. Yes, I would say that the the cost of having your will done with a will, oh, sorry, with a lawyer, is far less than the potential litigation <laughs> your family is going to go through. Um, if you don't have a properly drafted will, if you, you've tried to do it yourself and you've just missed something that's really important. That's right. Now, that takes me to my next question. Actually, two questions. One is, do I need to have someone who's going to be my trustee, who's going to take care of, who's going to carry out my wishes? And who should that person be? And one other, okay, I'll come to the other question later, because this is a big one first. Who should be my trustee? So for your, for your will, you're talking about naming your executor first, and the executor is the person who is going to administer your assets. So basically, they're going to determine where all your assets are after your death and make sure all your debts and taxes are paid, and then distribute the balance of your assets in accordance with your will, the instructions in your will. That's basically what an executor would do. So choosing your executor, depending on the complexity of your estate, really depends. You could have a lot of people name their spouse as their primary executor. And sometimes that makes sense because for the most part, spouses have named each other as joint owners. So all the assets are going to pass to the survivor anyway. So there's really not a lot to administer. Um, and then oftentimes what people do is they name their children as the alternate executors. So in the event that the spouse is predeceased, then the children are named as the backup executors. And again, sometimes that makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. If you have a business in your, in your estate that is going to require a little more complexity, a little more knowledge than maybe one or more of your children have, then naming your children perhaps isn't the best idea. Or if you have one child involved in the business and the others aren't, and there are business decisions that need to be made, and um, some of the executives just don't understand that, maybe not the best decision. If you have a child who, or children that don't get along with one another, again, maybe not the best decision to name both or all of them together making those decisions, because you already know those decisions are going to be hard to come by. So, in some situations, it does make sense to name a spouse or um, your children or another family member. <laughs> but in more complex situations, there are also trust companies that can step in and help. So, Susanna, thanks for that. Um, the question that comes up next is executor and trustee. What's the difference and do I need both? Sure. So it really depends on how you set up your will and, and the situations you're trying to deal with. So like I said, the executor is the person who is going to be gathering in your assets and distributing your assets in accordance with your will. If you've set up trusts, then oftentimes that executor also takes on the role as trustee. 
Um, and that's not, it doesn't necessarily have to happen that way. But generally speaking, you have your executor, then you've set up a trust. Let's say there's a trust for a child until the age of 25. Um, that executor takes over the role of trustee and manages the trust for that child until the age of 25. Now, those individuals can be different. You can have your executor who is dealing with the administration of your estate, and then you can have someone different who's managing the trust on behalf of a particular uh, beneficiary. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, depending on the size of the trust, it, it could be a bank or it could be the trust side of the bank that, that looks after um, the assets. It could also be a person. Could it also be a lawyer? Oh, it depends on the lawyer. We wouldn't do that at our firm. We don't step in as, as executor trustee. Um, but for, for sure, there are other individuals who could act as the trustee. Um, a trust company would be able to help out in that situation as well. And with a trust company, they have um, the expertise to be able to deal with more complex trusts as well. That's correct. And, and um, Susanna, with the, you know, the probate or admin tax, you call it, what is it and how do we minimize it for our clients? Sure. So the, the estate administration tax is a tax that is paid or a fee that's paid um, typically for Ontario residents who are going through the probate process um, with their will. And essentially what the probate process is, is where the executor has to make an application to the court to be officially designated as the executor of the estate. And that's required by banks and by the land registry office for the most part. So where you're dealing with third parties, those third parties will require probate or what the executor receives, which is the certificate of appointment of a state trustee. So once they receive that certificate, then they can go to third parties and say, I'm officially named as the executor. And then the bank or the registry office will be able to deal with those, in, those individuals. Now, when that application is made, there is a state administration tax of one and a half percent over the first $50,000 of the estate that's payable by the estate on the value of the assets that are going through the probate process. Now, I'm choosing my words very carefully because where there are assets that don't really require the, the probate process where you're not dealing with third parties to transfer those assets, like for instance, shares in a private corporation, you can set up a secondary will and move those assets into the secondary will and only have to probate the primary will, the first will that has those assets that really do require probate. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, it's the estate administration tax is payable only on those assets are that are going through the probate process. So those ones that have been carved out and put into the secondary will, those will go through the probate process. And as a result, that estate administration tax is not payable on the value of those assets. So secondary will, meaning you have your primary will that takes care of the family side of assets. And then are you talking secondary will for the business and the corporations, or it could be assets that are just um, simply your shares in another corporation? So it would be assets. So the primary will would have assets that require probate as opposed to those assets that don't require probate. So I'm going to take you through those assets that don't require probate for the most part are sh shares that you have in a private corporation. Okay. So not publicly traded shares, just shares that you have in a family business or in a professional corporation. Um, so personally held shares in a private corporation, those can go into the secondary will. Nice. Personal effects, jewelry, furniture, um, things along those lines. Those, when you transfer, you're not dealing with a third party. Those can be carved out and put into the secondary will. So it's not just corporate assets that we're talking about. It's those assets that don't require the probate process where you're really not dealing with that third party. Personal belongings could also be put into that. So if yes. I see a lot of jewelry or I have antiques or paintings and things like that could go in that. Those you would be able to put into the secondary will. Yes. Okay. okay sounds good. 
I'm learning so much that I'm actually feeling the, the fever of learning. <laughs> So, but there are other ways that you can save on the probate tax. And I, I do want to point out, trying to save on probate tax is not always the best approach to your estate planning. You shouldn't, that shouldn't be the primary purpose of your estate planning. Mm -hmm. um, but there are ways to minimize the amount that, that needs to be paid. So aside from multiple wills, um, you can also hold assets jointly. So typically spouses will hold assets jointly and it passes by right of survivorship from one to the other. And because it's passing by right of survivorship, it's passing outside of your, your estate. It doesn't go through your will. So that asset that you hold jointly won't be subject to probate tax on the passing from one to the other. Now, once it's in the survivor's hands upon their death, it would go through the probate process if it's an asset that requires probate. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't have a spouse anymore. Why don't I put my children on title? Or why don't I add my children to my bank account? And aside from some tax issues, which I'm not going to get into, um, my reasons for not adding your child to an account or to your home is that they are now part owners of that asset. And if they have creditors, including potentially spouses or ex-spouses, then that asset could be subject to claims from those creditors. So you may have your home and now you've added your child as a joint owner and that home may need, may need they may need to sell that home. You may need to sell it um, to satisfy your child's creditors. And then another, another reason is you add your child to your home. Now you need their consent. If you need to sell the home because you're, no longer able to live at home by yourself, you need to move to a different place and you need the money from your home to fund that, you have to get their consent to sell. So and they're not lose, always willing to do that. You lose that control, right? Over your asset by adding yeah. the person. And I think, um, Susanna, you're so right. It's also really a sensitive topic with mixed families because, you know, owning properties jointly is easy if you're in one um, one family situation, but having two families and then owning properties with your current spouse, um, I always refer them to a lawyer. I always say, I'm not an expert when it comes to designing your will, so have that discussion with your lawyer and find out, find the right happy medium because you don't want to upset your family that you're with now, but you also don't want to be, you know, not fair to the family that you were with or mm -hmm. your children. Mm -hmm. um, so just the other thing that I want to mention about joint assets is if you name an adult child as a joint owner and an asset, it's not necessarily going to bypass the probate process because there is a presumption that um, that child is holding the asset for convenience and it's not, it's not actually a true joint owner relationship with the right of survivorship. So you may be going through this process and at the end of the day, it's just going to go back into your estate anyway. And that's not a good situation for anybody if that happens. No, so it would, if that's not what the intent is, then absolutely not. Um, we talk a lot about trust. Like to me, when I first joined the financial industry, I used to think trust is only for, you know how you watch movies and you have these kids that have a trust of, you know, $100 million and they're very rich. I thought that was the only people that, <laughs> that should have or had to have a trust. But this is a, a very good state planning strategy. Can you elaborate a little bit more on trust accounts? I think in, in some situations, having a trust, a testamentary trust in your will does make sense. It is good for planning, especially for those beneficiaries who may need extra help, um, especially for minors and when I say minors, first of all, if you're under the age of 18, a trust has to be set up for you. But I would extend minors beyond 18 and say for children, if you're providing for your own children, 
you might want to put in a trust that goes a bit longer than the age of 18. And for a lot of the planning that we do, we set up trusts for, our, for children, including me for my own, where those trusts extend to the age of 30. And so they're, they're discretionary trusts, which means they're going to be working with the, the trustee, the estate trustee, to receive funds out of those trusts, but they don't have full control over that money. So they can't, um, they can't make a mistake and, and lose it all um, in one shot. It is there managed by someone else over a period of time. So trust for minor children and even for children a bit older than that, I think is, is a great way to set up your, um, the distribution of your assets to, to children. You can also set up spousal trusts. So where, and this is very common in a situation where you have children from an, another relationship and you have a current spouse and you wanna set up a, a trust for them, but also preserve money for those other children or even for the, the children you have with that spouse. So what that does is it allows the spouse to have the benefit of the assets and the income generated by those assets throughout his or her lifetime. And then on his or her death, whatever is left in the trust would be available for the next uh, beneficiaries, typically children. And I'd say the, the only thing to be really careful with when you're setting up a trust like that is if that, that second spouse, for instance, happens to be a much younger spouse, and it's now based on the lifetime of that spouse, you need to keep in mind how old your children are going to be on that spouse's death. Because if they're close in age, then your children wouldn't be receiving anything from your estate if you've put everything into that trust until the spouse dies, which could lead to a situation where a child of yours has died before that spouse has died. So that is, um, that is something that I have seen happen and really would recommend that if you are doing a trust for a spouse that, and it's a, a, a second spouse and you have children from a previous relationship, that you really pay attention to the ages. So would you, um, you recommend two separate trusts in, in such a situation? You certainly could. And it really depends on the situation and the ages of your children and, and what your overall intentions are. But absolutely, you could, you could say, for instance, half the estate goes into a trust for my spouse and half the estate is for the children. Um, you could certainly do it that way if there are enough assets. Got it. And then I'd say another kind of important trust, sorry to cut you off. <laughs> another important trust is a Henson trust. And this is a trust that you would set up for a beneficiary who is receiving government support, government disability support. And what this trust allows is for the individual, the beneficiary to continue receiving that government support. Um, but also have money set aside in a trust for them should they need it. So the trouble with not setting up a trust properly for those individuals who are receiving this, the government support, government disability support, is if you were to say everything goes to, into a trust for them and they, they can access the funds through the, the trustee as needed, and there isn't special language in it that says it doesn't become theirs unless it's actually paid to them, then you could be creating a situation where their government support is going to get clawed back. Oh my God. And that's not something that you really want to happen. So this type of trust, this Henson Trust, does protect those government support payments while still allowing for um, provisions to be made to that beneficiary from, from the trust. Wow. So we talked about spousal trust, Henson Trust, and we talked about... Um, you know, the, the the trust for minors and children. So there are so many different strategies that you can put in place for a good state plan, um, you know, for someone to kind of have that peace of mind. Absolutely. Is there anything else that, um, you know, when, when you're creating a will, is there anything else that you should keep in mind or any documentation or any advice from you that is, um, you know, very important for them to, to start with? I would say to make it easier for your executor, you should keep a list of your current assets, where your bank accounts are, 
um, what real estate you own, shares and corporations that you may have, especially if they are, um, they're not your spouse and they wouldn't necessarily be privy to all of this information or, or know where the starting place is. So certainly having that, that starting point for an executor is really good. It at least gives them a head start, doesn't make the job so complicated because being an, an executor, it, it is a job. It is a job that will take time. It will take commitment. And the more organized that you can be, the better it is for your executor and the smoother the administration will be. Oh, absolutely. Like that, you're talking about being prepared to, to actually have that meeting w with the lawyer. And it saves you time and money too, right? When you're prepared and all your documentation is ready. Absolutely. But even after that, so as... As your assets may change and you don't necessarily have to update your will, just keeping keeping your your list of assets and just any documentation up to date for your executor, like a checklist for your executor, would be great for your executor. Um, but I would say outside of your will, there are also powers of attorney that really people should consider. And I quite frankly think powers of attorney are are the more important document. Um, not that wills aren't because wills are absolutely very important, but your powers of attorney are the documents that come into play while you're still alive, but it's a situation where you may not be able to make decisions for yourself anymore. So there are two, there's one for personal care and there's one for property. And the one for personal care deals with everything to do with your body when you are not able to make decisions for yourself. So typically people think, okay, it's a situation where I'm in the hospital and the doctor says, do we pull the plug or not? And um, that's correct. That's a situation where your attorney for personal care would come into play. They would make that decision. But it extends beyond that um, in situations where you, you have dementia, you can't live at home anymore, and someone has to decide where you're going to live. And it will be that attorney for personal care who decides, okay, where are you going to live now? Are you going to um, move to one particular residence? Are you going to move in with, with a child or a family member? Um, is it possible to set up your house so that you can get the care that you need and still stay in your home? Um, even decisions about your, getting your hair cut and what clothes you're going to be wearing, because someone has to do all of this for you if you're incapable of doing it yourself. And it also extends to um, treatment. So if, if a decision needs to be made about treatment and you're not capable of giving those instructions, it would be your attorney for personal care who makes those decisions for you. Now for personal care, the person that you name can be as young as 16 and I do not recommend that <laughs> at all. I am saying much older than 16. 16 is very young to be making decisions about um, end of life and, and things like that, especially for a parent. Mm -hmm. And they have to have a genuine concern for your well being. So, those are, are some requirements for your attorney for personal care. So, in this case, it can't be a trust company, for instance. And then your other power of attorney is your power of attorney for property. And that power of attorney, when we prepare them, they're continuing powers of attorney, which means they come into effect immediately and they continue in the event that you're unable to manage your finances. And these ones, these powers of attorney give the person that you named your attorney for property, the ability to manage your assets and finances on your behalf. Now, what they cannot do is make a new will for you and change your beneficiary designations. So those are things that they can't do, but they can be make decisions about how your money is invested. Um, they can sell your home. Um, all those things that you can do with your assets, with your property, they would be able to do for you. Well, that's really good to know. So power of attorney for personal care and power of attorney for property, but Correct. they cannot make decisions on uh, changing beneficiaries or selling properties. So, so what happens is... So they can make decisions about selling property. They can, okay. Yes. So for selling property, they can. Um, for making a new will for you, they cannot. Yes. But what, they, what your attorneys for property should also do is they should, if it's a situation where you're no longer capable mm -hmm. of making those decisions, 
what they should do is take a look at your will to make sure that if it's a situation where they need to start selling your assets to care for you, that they're not selling assets that you have specifically stated in your will, you would like to go to a particular beneficiary. So they should be doing their best to save those assets for the beneficiary so that the, um, the intent in the will is still met. Well, you're speaking a lot of the language that, um, you know, when we have conversations with our clients as financial planners, things have changed quite a bit. People are living longer, not necessarily healthier, but longer. And when I first became a financial planner, Susanna, we used to talk about retirement from 65 to 70, maybe 75, because people talked about longevity. Today, we talk about 60 or 55 to 90. Yeah. Much longer period. And if you're incapable, if your health is not good, and, you know, all these decisions people have not thought about. And, you know, one good thing I do with my clients is I always ask them for a copy of their will. If they trust me enough with all their finances and investment, they usually give me a copy of their will as well. And if there's mm -hmm. anything that needs to be altered or changed, we discuss it. And I always tell them, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I always say copy of your will should be with your lawyer, with your financial planner, and also one trusted person other than, you know, all the beneficiaries. So Sorry, it's funny. <laughs> so we would typically, when we do wills for our clients, we keep the original in our vault okay. because... People tend to move from home to home or uh, clean out their, their personal papers and sometimes it gets lost or thrown out. And so if it's at the firm, if it's in our vault, we know it's there, it's not going anywhere. And then we would provide a copy and that copy is unsigned so that no one can misuse it. Yes. No one can say this is the last will even though they've gone and done a new will. So... As far as giving out to other people, um, financial advisor, I would say, is fine because they have a trusted relationship and um, even an accountant. But for family members, that's up to them. I think that being open with your family about what you've done, who you've named, helps keep down the litigation at the end of the day. Um, but a lot of people just aren't comfortable doing that. A lot of people are very private and they want to keep their, their will and, and all of that. They want to keep it private. That's not something that people need to know until the date of their death, but most certainly a financial advisor or planner should be taking a look at it just to make sure it works with their assets. And of course the lawyer having it in their vault is, is I would say the best protection for that document. There is only one original will. So that, thanks for answering that because, you know, when I looked at these wills and they were not signed, I guess it's a very normal practice for lawyers to give out a copy without signature. I was wondering why that is the case. So thank you for actually clarifying that because nobody could answer that for me. <laughs> yeah, that is why. Thank you so much, Susanna. This uh, session was very informative and uh, your expertise and your intelligence, your I see your community work, your volunteer hours. You've been amazing as a community leader. And the, this month is a financial literacy month. So I hope everybody enjoys this video, learning about wills and power of attorneys and reaches out to you if they need more help. I know you're very busy, so only email is, is best for them to send out or reach out to you. I really appreciate your time. Is there anything else that you wanna share with our audience today? Uh, only that it's also make a will month. So if you haven't got your wills up to date or you haven't got a will at all, then this is the best month to go ahead and make your will. Absolutely. I didn't know that. See, new things <laughs> that we've learned. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate your time and uh, your participation. Thanks so much, Seema.